Hello, everybody. My name is Padraig Otuma, and you're all very, very welcome to the Corimila Advent Series for 2021. We're delighted that you're here. Um, I think Johnny, who is under a Corimila Admin, has just invited everybody to share where they're from. Um, and it's a great thing to see so many people from different parts of the world joining us. Thanks very much for taking time, whatever time of the day it is for you. Um, I have temporarily relocated to New York City, so I am on 2nd Avenue. You'll hear some sirens going back and forth um, with my apologies for all of that. If the sirens are too loud, I'll mute myself if it ever gets too loud. New York City is Lenape land, and um, it's a, a joy to always recognize the, in, the indigenous inhabitants of people who continue to have a um, claim and relationship with the Lenape Hoking land here. So if you are in a place that has been, um, that has been, that has a history of being stolen, of being um, forcibly ceded, of being trickstered out of ownership, well, then it's always a, 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 something that we'll invite you to, to share that as you come in to, to join us here. Um, we're going to be speaking about spirituality and conflict, particularly the Gospels and conflict over the next four weeks. Um, I used to lead the Corimila community and have, with great joy, um, passed on that job to Alex who I'll be in contact with later on tonight, later on um, this evening. And then um, we will be uh, talking about a particular text from the Gospel that he has um, chosen and talking about the dynamics of that. We're not choosing the Advent texts. So if you think you're going to get cheat notes for your, for your preaching, if you are preaching, you'll have to sign up to Spirituality of Conflict. Um, we're, we aren't giving, um, we aren't looking particularly at the texts for Advent. We're just looking at texts that are from the Gospels to speak about the dynamics of conflict. Um, Corimila began in 1965 as a witness to peace um, for all the inhabitants of Ireland, particularly those in the north, um, as um, sectarianism was growing and growing and those people had their ear to the ground knew that unfortunately violence was almost inevitable and unfortunately it was. We had the latest outbreak of troubles from 1968 to 1998, during which time three and a half thousand people lost their lives. Um, 80,000 people were maimed and 500,000 people were directly affected by grief and conflict. And that is in a population in the north of Ireland of only one and a half million. So that's one in three, which is a way of saying everybody knows somebody. And our entire world, fortunately, is a world that knows so much to do with conflict. 130 out of the 180 states recognized by the UN have had some kind of need of a peace treaty. And typically peace treaties take 30 iterations before they arrive at something that's workable. And so we are, uh, as a global population, in need of increasing capacity and intelligence to talk about the dynamics of conflict. And so we will be doing that over the next four weeks. Um, tonight, I'll be speaking with Alex Wimberley, who's the leader of the Corimila community um, in Ballycastle in the north of Ireland. Um, and next week, I'll be speaking with Ruth Harvey, who is the leader of the Iona community um, in Scotland, but with a worldwide membership. The week after that, I'll be speaking with Janet Foggy. She is a historian as well as a theologian, and she is the chief executive officer of Community Energy Scotland. And we'll particularly be thinking about conflict when it comes to questions to do with Earth when we're speaking with Janet. And then our final week, we'll be speaking with Pat Bennett. She is a writer and a scientist and a liturgist. And she will be speaking uh, about the dynamics of being, um, of writing a book about spirituality and conflict and sharing a gospel text that's relevant from that. So that is all the um, introductions we need for that. I would like to introduce um, for your delight, the wonderful Alex Wimberley. Alex is um, from the United States. He has been living in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, particularly over the last 10, 15 years, um, on and off, doing a lot of work as a Presbyterian minister. And since 2019, he has been the, the Corimila community. He has a PhD in history from Notre Dame. I always have to remind myself how to pronounce that in the American way. And he brings a great humor and insight and warmth into the question about what does it mean to be a witness of faith in the context of um, in the context of, uh, of of conflict and peace. So, we be delighted for um, to have this conversation. Alex, you're very welcome. Oh, Patrick, it's a great joy to be with you this uh -huh. evening. For you to be in the states and for me to be here, yeah, I so know. that's great. Yeah. Swap countries. Where are you at the moment, Alex? 
I'm in I'm in the Kilgore's house. So next door to the house that I live in, according okay. to a number, actually it's the Kilgore's and the Bairds have a place that they let me use as their studio, which is very helpful oh, nice. because I have three small children. And I have at least some sense that it will remain quiet for our time together this evening. <laughs> yeah. And I believe you have a dog recently too. Yes, you may hear her. <laughs> okay, you brought the dog with you. Okay. Well. Alex, um, I'd like to start off by asking you a fairly personal question, and you can answer this in any way you want. We're going to be speaking about the Gospels in conflict tonight, and I'd like to start off by asking you, what are some of your habits when you find yourself in conflict? Of course, you've got a whole variety, depending as to who you're in conflict with, but what are some of the things you know about yourself? Oh, that's, I mean, Patrick, I don't think I've ever actually thought about my habits when I come into conflict. That's really interesting. Um, what I'm finding myself think about is that the way I behave now is much differently, much different than the way I would have earlier in my life. Um, I think probably my habit now is to shrink back and assume that whatever has gone wrong in some relationship that I'm in conflict, um, that probably the other person is right, and there's something about me that I need to need okay. to listen to very. And that's uh, that's something that I'm not doing probably um, as often or as well as I should. But certainly what I've noticed in that habit is a great change from the way I would have been years ago. So that's probably the first habit that I'm aware of. Well, do you mean years ago you might have thought that the other person was wrong and that they... I needed... think probably, yes. I think also years ago I would have, with great brashness and arrogance, thought, whatever this is, we'll just step into it, we'll be fine. And I probably can't hurt anybody too badly with whatever we're going to get into. I didn't have a sense of the risk that myself or the other person might have been in, in terms of really um, engaging in that conflict, probably speaks a great deal of the privilege that I enjoy, but also I think of just the insensitivity that I had to know that how I behave and how I act around other people can be bruising. I remember um, at seminary, um, um, a friend of mine told me, you know, so-and-so, you're really, you're really going at that person quite a bit in your argument, in your conflict. And I felt myself thinking, oh, sure. I mean, they know I love them. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing in our relationship that is, you know, going to be permanently damaged by this. And my friend said, I don't think that is the case. I don't think you realize just how bruising and what an effect you have on other people is with your strong personality. And um, part of my evolution and hopefully maturity is that uh, I have learned perhaps to pull back and think about my own uh, mm. effect on other people and also to kind of start with the premise that they're probably speaking some truth that I need to hear. Yeah. Who was that friend who said that to you? That's a powerful that, thing. To that was my wife. <laughs> <laughs> she, okay. she, was, she was my friend at the time. She's okay. now my my partner in life. Yes. So I, another another sign of my maturity that. Uh, I, I was going to say I hope you're still friends with that person because it sounds like they're an amazing friend. Well, anyway. I hope I'm still friends with that person too. She may be here. Right? Well. Um, that kind of thing to be told about the, you know, you measure your own intention and somebody else says, actually, forget your intention. Here's your impact. A complicated thing to hear. You know, you might think, oh, I'm friendly and gentle, you know, so therefore everybody takes. Was that hard? Exactly. For you? Exactly. I mean, Patrick, I, uh, I think I'm so charming and everybody will see it that way. And in, in fact, I'm obnoxious and off putting and people are being very polite by sticking around to hear the rest of my sentence. So, I mean, that is a huge piece of learning for me and uh, something I hope I was more aware of. Yeah. Was your religious background one where conversations about conflict took part? I know you're from a Presbyterian family. You can touch on that briefly. Yeah. So I grew up, I grew up in Indiana. Uh, actually, I mean, it's lovely to be able to tell you that I, I grew up on Potawatomi and Miami lands. And I grew up uh, the son of a manse, a Presbyterian minister, it was my father, my grandfather, my great grandfather. It seeped in the tissues of the, of the family. And uh, yeah, talking about conflict and getting into conflict was part of what we thought religion was about. And so the church was a place to really express controversial ideas and to let your brain and your, and your faith explore things in, a, in, a, in what we knew, I hope, instinctively was a safe 
and um, secure context of there's nothing that you can do in this space that will break your relationship with God and hopefully not your relationship with other people. Mm -hmm. And so it became a playground for for talking about things that in other contexts would be more conflicted and more damaging. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll, I'll ask you a little bit more about your, uh, you know, your your background and uh, and what it's like for you to be living in Belfast and all across the north for many years now. Um, after a while, but first of all, like I asked you in preparation for this, if you could choose a text that you'd like to talk about, and I wonder um, if you could read that out. Johnny uh, will share that text so that people can see it on their screen, and then Alex, I wonder if you could read it out, and I'll have a few questions for you. Of course, this is from uh, the first book of John, the first chapter of John, obviously, and it's the call of Nathaniel. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Hmm. Thanks very much. Um, my, my first question is, I'm so curious, um, what led you to choose this text, Alex, as you thought well, about it, the gospel? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's good for me to remember that what we're doing here with this project of Spiritual Body of Conflict is to, is to look at conflict through the lens of scripture and to look, through, look at scriptures through the lens of conflict. I am, as you were saying, a Presbyterian minister and have grown up in that very arrogant practice of thinking you have something to say to people on a Sunday morning. Here's the answer to the question you didn't know you should be asking. Let me tell you it. And, and let me talk for 20 at least minutes um, until you're able to, to think about something else. This passage, for whatever reason, led me not to try to figure out, well, where is the answer that, I'm, that I think I already know in this story about the call of Nathaniel? This passage, for whatever reason, in, in this um, encounter with it, let me just more and more questions and to questions mm -hmm. about stereotyping and to questions about how we might um, overcome the stereotyping that I think so many of us, well, we're all guilty of and all a, a part of, but um, how do we get around it? And does this, mm -hmm. does, this, does this scripture passage with that right lens give us scope to see new things? Hmm. And where, where, why is that of interest to you? Like, why is the word stereotyping and that conversation of that is something that uh, is of curiosity to you? Well, certainly the work at Corimila has been one of bringing people into relationships. Um, obviously, we are so tied up in stories of us and them, not only in Northern Ireland, not only in Corimila, but as humans. And what we, what we discover at Corimila is that if we can get people into a room and simply be together in relationship, the connection you make with an individual allows you to see them beyond the stereotype that you perhaps assigned to them when you didn't know them well, and you can overcome that through the actual encounter with the person, the relationship that you're able to form. I think what we see in this passage is just a great example of, you know, can anything good come out of Nazareth is um, this is a Canaanite, uh, so sorry, not Canaanite, a, a man from Cana, uh, Nathaniel, talking about a neighboring village, uh, Nazareth, and saying, could anything good come out of there? I mean, he is so dismissive of Jesus, uh, just mm -hmm. knowing that he's from, from Nazareth. Uh, and yet the connections I find in this passage, with all of these place names and all of this kind of chain of uh, Jesus to Philip to Nathaniel, um, allows us to see that there's there are real relationships that allow Nathaniel to get around uh, those stereotypes of somebody from Nazareth 
and actually meet Jesus as somebody that he is willing to trust, in part because Philip leads him to him uh, because of the relationship he already has. With yeah, him. Philip plays such a pivotal role in that situation, you know, not by kind of engaging in the theory of the history to say, oh, you, you're standing in the wrong place regarding that. He just says, come on, have an experience. Yeah, come and see, which is such a lovely, you know, a, a repeated line in scripture. But mm -hmm. here it's, let's test that stereotype. Let's go and see, you know, what that's like. Yeah. In your work, you know, not only in Carmela, but in many of your years of ministry as a minister before that, um, what are the risks involved in trying to have an experience of come and see? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the risks are that you're going to be changed and um, and you'll have your mind changed. And certainly, obviously, I would like to think that Christians can have the faith to to risk that all the time, that if we're if what we're talking about is true, then there's nothing that we can go and see or encounter that will 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 shake or threaten uh, what we think is most true. And if what we do go and see and experience and encounter shakes what we think is most true, then it probably wasn't that true to begin with or needed to be shaken. So, yeah. I mean, there is that that fear of change, but I think that's the call of, of, of faith is to, is to go out on those limbs. Yeah. Um, like, uh, one of the reasons why I'm often very nervous about the word uh, Messiah or mission as well is because it can often imply that, you know, people involved in Christianities have something to give to the world. <laughs> Half the time, I think that they have to accept the message that they wish to give. Um, wh what do you notice about faith communities and their own practices of conflict dynamics? Oh, faith communities are, are wonderfully, I mean, the irony is beautiful, the hypocrisy is more troubling. But uh, the, yeah, I mean, as a Christian, I think that there's something about uh, the story of Jesus and the stories that we're counting in gospel that are true about humans, which mean that they are true about me. And mm -hmm. so, um, certainly I too have diminishing patience for a religion or a faith or a Christianity that says we've got the answer and we want you to hear it and, and you should be more like us. I'm more interested in a Christianity that says the faith that I have in the, uh, in the love of God and the love of humanity allows me to go and be changed by the humans that I meet and, and to, to, to meet the God that is as alive in those and those people is whatever be alive in me. And I do think that also the coming and seeing, the going and, and becoming is, is the great joy in this. Uh, um, part of what we love about the Spirituality Conflict Project is that, and this lens of conflict and this, I, this ability to use this, the scripture as in that playground to talk about things that are real in our life is that, um, it's just more fun to go into these passages without having the answer you're trying to find. I, I remember, you know, the most fun I had with scripture study and stuff was at seminary when I obviously didn't know anything because I was new at the practice of trying to do good scripture analysis. And then by the time you get out of seminary, you're supposed to then go out to congregations, as you're saying, have that mission to go out and tell people the good news. Where in fact, what's more fun is to go out to a congregation of people who are just as ignorant and just as wise as you and discover the good news together mm. through that conversation and through the through the story that the, the of yourself and the story within the scripture that is ours to find. Yeah, I mean, you're talking in a certain way about ways within which um, conflict can be can be fruitful. Uh, did it take you a while to think about conflict as fruitful, or did you grow up in an environment where that was already part of your imagination? Like, I'll tell you, like I certainly grew up in an where I just thought that every conflict should be ceased and ideally don't go into it. And so I had a lot of fear about conflict. Uh, what about you? Yeah, I didn't. And I mean, maybe not to the same degree. I think partly because I was, I was so sheltered from, from real suffering that conflict was more of a, a play thing rather than a real threat. I think there's probably some truth to that, hmm. much truth to that. I also think there was uh, the, the, the family that I grew up in, the church family I grew up in, my, well, there's our sensor. Uh, my, my hello, mother, Second my, Avenue. <laughs> exactly. My my mother, um, my mother was is is continually just um, fascinated by people. She's one of the great readers of my of my life, and she 
everything is a novel to her. Mm -hmm. And so all the people we encounter are great characters in this story of life. And so it would be so boring not to have drama. And so, <laughs> you know, and, and so, you know, every single thing can be turned into a great yarn. Uh, and if it's not, well, let's embellish it a little bit to make it more fun. So conflict in some ways is, is, is the drama, is the, the structure, the form, the wall we have to push against to, to grow and to mm -hmm. change. And so I have become, I, I, I'm not particularly frightened of conflict per se. Mm -hmm. I am, I am um, frightened of conflict that leads to harm and destruction. Oh, while you preempted me, I was going to ask you where for you would be a distinction between conflict that can be fruitful and then conflict that's destruction. I mean, do you want to say a little oh, bit I more think, about where that? Oh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not on a conflict expert in the way that some will be like you, but um, conflict itself is just inevitable in human life. But um, harm and 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 um, and the abuse of power is is something that I think we can just we just need to stand against. I mean, we just stand mm -hmm. against it. We do not embrace and say that this is something we need to lean into. This is something yeah. we need to stop. Yeah. Like I'm aware, like uh, say the obvious, you and I are both men and this text too is about men in conversation and playing around stereotypes. And when it comes to questions to do with the practicing of power and practicing of power that can be abusive in public, I think uh, us men have a lot of um, accountability to walk into and a lot of confession to name and a lot of ways within which I think in structures we need to get out of the way. How do you hold together um, that that conflict, which is societal, and then your responsibility as a man? Oh, okay. I mean, um, I am such a novice in this, uh, Padraig. I mean, I, I stand in a position that is just perfectly unaware of. Like, but like I was saying before, when I thought I was being playful, I was actually being bruising. I do not recognize the power that I have because I don't think of myself as a threat to anyone uh, or, or a, I don't, I don't see myself in the way that, um, that quite rightly white male straight American men minister types can and should be um, initially categorized. I mean, there's something about this text that's also about the stereotypes and generalizations, there's a kernel of truth and, and we need to, and we need to deconstruct that. For me, as wonderful and charming as I think I am, uh, I am also going to simply by what I represent in my face, in my vocation, in my, in my accent, in my, in the way I stand and the way I present myself, I can actually, um, affect people in ways that um, that I, I don't recognize and yet need to be aware of. Hmm. Yeah. I'm going to turn to your prayer, Alex, I'd like it. If you could read that prayer, Johnny's going to share it, and then we'll talk a little bit about the prayer. Yeah. So a prayer based on this, this, this struggling with this passage. God who calls us to follow God who invites us to question. You allow us to come as we truly are and to see beyond our limited view. As we relocate ourselves within the reach of your grace, may our beckoning connections lead us from our set positions so we can gain a fuller sense of the good news we still can hear. Mm. Amen. <laughs> I wonder, Johnny, if you could leave that up for a sec, because Alex, I want to ask you, what for you is the particular word in that prayer that you think is a word of, of importance for you right now? Um, I think relocate is, a, is an important one for me. Um, Decentering ourselves from the, from the, from the story. Um, you know, we spent... Uh, I, I'm, I'm becoming bored with narratives that make whoever is telling the story into, um, into the hero. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea that the story is about us. And I think that that, you can be, you, you can show some self uh, reflection and still be self-centered. Mm -hmm. And I think that 
there's a lot of work going on right now in terms of you know churches, people in power beginning to realize, like I am, the effect that we can have on other people. But we can still make that a story about us, where we get to be the hero in in our matur in our in our maturation story, as it were, and yeah. the relocating of ourselves out from the center, and to actually realize that it may be there on the margins that we ourselves experience the good news. Hmm. That um, is just uh, it's probably an important thing for me to to wrestle hmm. with, and that's the word that right in the center of that prayer is actually forcing me to to move out to the side. Hmm. Okay. Um, are there ways, Alex, like I'm, I'm really curious about your experience of moving as an American, American Presbyterian to, to Ireland and particularly Northern Ireland, where Presbyterianism has a, a different witness there and has a, an extraordinary, extraordinary long history of faithfulness and social justice. Um, how did you, I mean, you relocated yourself you know, uh, yeah. from one continent to another, uh, maybe over the last, uh, just to give people a timeline. Is, like most of the last 15, 16 years or so? Yeah, no. So I, I first came to Northern Ireland when I was five, came back when I was 15, came for a year as a seminary student 20 years ago, came as a minister 15 years ago, then went back to the States to do more studies, didn't feel at home the way I thought I would, came back to Corrymeela, um, well, came to Northern Ireland in the context of Corrymeela about four years ago. I do feel more at home in, in many ways here, even though mm. home is also back in Indiana. Um, relocation, I, I mean, okay, well, you know, you think it's nice to be uh, a white male Presbyterian in Northern Indiana. You should try being a white male Presbyterian minister in Belfast. It's really nice. You can be right at the heart of the conversation and get invited to things that you had no right being at. Hmm. So I found myself as a minister in Belfast um, having more of an effect on people and having more influence than I had any, any right to have which was a lovely thing to be able to experience. But also I found, and hopefully did this in a, in, a, in a sensitive way, being from outside could ask questions nobody else was dumb enough to ask because nobody else was as dumb as I to ask those silly questions like, why do you do that? Or, you know, and, and you know, you've done this and this and this, but that doesn't make any sense to me. Can you tell me more about that? So the relocation did have a, a benefit in that sense and, and gives you, I, I, benefit from having a compatibility with the culture but enough of a quirk with the culture that i can see things in different ways and ask things with you know different accents you know, different, different okay. hmm. um, just preparing people that in about five minutes we're going to invite some questions um from uh people you're not able to unmute yourself so you can either put it into the chat or you can raise your hand and we'll spotlight you and then you can and we'll unmute you as well um but uh, I have another question for you, Alex. Like, I am curious about the conflicts of being um, uh, someone from the United States who is living now in a place that has a particular and complex history of conflict and sectarianism and murder. Um, what was it that you needed to learn in order to be a witness to your faith as well as a witness to peace um, in the context of relocating? Well, a lot of things. Uh, first off, the people in Northern Ireland do not need another American telling them what to do and that. Um, uh, and also part of this relocation um, issue and this issue of place. I mean, the scripture passage that we were looking at, there are so many place names and they each mean something to. Mm. One of the things I learned um, embarrassingly late uh, in my context in Belfast as a minister and at Corrymeela is that Again, this casual kind of offhanded sort of um, talking about place names and not realizing that if I mention Bombay Street, that means something. Or if mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saying, oh, I'll, I'm saying to somebody like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to go down Darabogi Avenue. The, the possibility that the person I'm speaking to has a family member who, who was murdered on that, on that avenue or down that street. Or when they hear the place name, they do not have... Um, Levy Avenue suburbia in, in mind. They have the place where, uh, you know, an, an explosion, you know, killed somebody that they love. Yeah. So, I mean, that sort of awareness is, is something that um, I've had to learn. Mm. And yeah, and so that's one thing. 
That's extraordinary. I mean, lots of people will kind of use the phrase about walking on holy ground, but you're talking about something where the word holy isn't necessarily the right word, maybe something like grieving ground or a way within yeah. which um, place has a memory of trauma. Absolutely. Um, I am just, I really am struck by <laughs> one of the, one of the privileges, joys in the right word of, of, Corey Mila is that you do come into encounters with people here and the most mundane conversations can lead to the most profound uh, sort of conversations. Mm -hmm. And you realize just how sacred the stories are that people are telling about their own lives that uh, are much more important in the context to listen to than the sacred story that you want to share mm -hmm. with them from a text or something. Yeah. Uh, that 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 yes, and the text messages are coming through. I mean, those places of trauma, the backdrop of trauma, and the realize and and the, and and the re, and the realization that um, the conflicts that are playing out right now uh, are playing out on that grieving ground, that 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 traumatic backdrop, that little things that you think, well, why would that bother them so much? And mm -hmm. it may be irrational, but it is tied rooted to the to the place and to the to the grieving and the trauma that people are experiencing as if it were happening right now yeah i think lots of people might be familiar with i think it was freud talked about the narcissism of tiny difference and that uh that can sometimes mean you know that a methodist and a presbyterian because they think differently you know and they have this tiff or they find it hard to get along with each other but when you're speaking about a place that's known or a population and this is true all across the world a population that's known murder and systemic abuse and trauma this isn't the narcissism of tiny difference this is a kind of a realization of the extraordinary inherited power of grief and pain oh absolutely i mean um I mean, the scripture passage again, Nathaniel is from Cana and he is and he is disparaging the name of somebody from Nazareth, which is just over the hill. You know, so obviously there is, you know, they are there. And, and he, you know, this project, I mean, the, the genetic difference between people in England and people in Ireland, you know, has been found to be very small. And yet, you know, we're, we're talking about blood brothers and people who are who are so close. And yet that proximity uh causes the friction behind you know to to just to burn in a way that that um that nothing else can yeah and yeah so i mean of course when i grew up you know being presbyterian and being from a long line of presbyterians you know we we told our um cork jokes about methodists i mean that's just what we did you know <laughs> i remember hearing carry man jokes all the time growing up and when I heard that most of Ireland told, told Corkman jokes, I was absolutely aghast. We're going to go to some questions, but first I do want, we're only going to do this once every week, um, but I do want to advertise a little thing if it's okay. Um, Alex and I, together with all the other people who we'll be speaking with um, over the next four weeks, are part of a, a project of British and Irish organizations of faith and peace who've been writing about conflict and the Gospels for the last five years. And we now have a book that's been edited by Pat Bennett um, of readings and prayers for Christmas and Advent. And that is available from um, your local bookshop or from Canterbury Press or the publishers or online. It's just hot off the press this week. In fact, it might be a few more days before it's formally released. But um, the publishers just sent us that photograph there. And then um, if you want to sign up for uh, weekly readings where the Gospels is read through the lens of conflict, you can go to spiritualityofconflict.com forward slash sign up. And there are about eight or nine of us on that writing group and a different one of us a reflection on the, the lectionary gospel reading that will be coming up that following Sunday. Um, and that's there so you can get that. It comes into your inbox at 7 a.m. Irish time on a Monday morning, which is 2 a.m. Uh, 2 a.m. in New York. So that's around the time it comes in. People so, eager to start on their sermons. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that does actually. We, we, we recently did. We recently did some um, a, a bit of a survey of the people who read. And I think about 25 percent of people who read are ministers who say thanks very much it gives me good ideas for my sermons and we're very happy um for that to be uh for you to cog as we'd say in ireland any of that that you want 
So I'm going to look at a few questions. Some people have been putting them into the chat. And then um, if anybody does want to ask their question, you're welcome to raise your hand and we'll come to you as you are able. But DL Mayfield has asked, um, I would love to hear a little bit more about Jesus in that John 1 passage and what he first said to Nathaniel, complimenting on him on being an Israelite with no deceit. How do you read that, Alex? <laughs> That's funny because I actually think that's probably a part of stereotyping as well. Uh, you know, he's here, here's an Israelite in which there is no deceit, you know, kind of is making a generalization about Israelites. I, what, what's funny to me about that, though, is that, and again, it's not to try to save Jesus from the narrative, which is a, a, something I think I'm too prone to do to try to like, well, we have to, we have to sanitize Jesus here. But there are two things about that. One is, I think he's talking about, um, Nathaniel as, as being maybe an exception to the rule and basically saying, you know, here's someone who cuts across that stereotype and isn't that interesting. And the other thing that's, I think, important to point out in terms of Jesus in that first line is that whereas um, Nathaniel, somebody from Cana, disparaging somebody from Nazareth, Jesus, an Israelite, is talking about Israelites. So it's almost as if it's kind of fair game of saying, let me talk about this generalization of a group. Uh, you know, we can be a certain way. Nathaniel may be different. Okay. So he's talking to his own in that sense and giving yeah. himself a certain kind of permission. Um, my dad used to always talk about the Protestant woman in his office and he'd always make sure to say, but she's lovely. And um, <laughs> I always thought oh, that. I, know. That, I, mean, that was, I mean, that was my experience in Belfast with my church. And so, you know, and they say, oh, well, someone's always Roman Catholic, but it's very nice. It was very <laughs> I know sometimes our kind of our little asides to, to show how inclusive we are actually show how low we're beginning. And that's a complicated thing. It reveals us, you know, rather than saying anything about the Catholic or the Protestant who or the Methodist who happens to be nice. Thanks, uh, Danielle, for that question. Here's another one. Um, this is from Miriam Stote. Um, how can others who aren't white, straight Christian men be empowered and heard of oppression gives them insights and wisdom that goes unheard? Well, I'm not sure I can answer that, except that, you know, people who are white male, straight Christian ministers need to shut up and listen um, and give and provide the space if, if, mm. as much as we can. Um, Audrey. Yeah. Well, are, are there, I was going to, are there, are there ways that you can create structures that are more attuned to hearing and more attuned to amplifying? Certainly, I would say at Corimila, one of the things that we're struggling with is that we're this lovely uh, community and we're very white and we're very middle class and we're very Protestant too. Well, we're more Protestant than Catholic for being an ecumenical um, community. And we end up drawing people into the community of people we already know. And, you know, until we get into more relationships with people and spend that time listening to others, we don't change ourselves and, and, and provide the space and the structure actively bringing people in who are not like us so that we can be, uh, uh, changed and improved by yeah. the by the inclusion of others. Mm. Thanks very much for that question, Miriam. Um, Kalani Padilla has said, um, Alex said that the irony of our shortcomings in conflict as Christians is beautiful. The hypocrisy is more troubling. I wonder, um, Kalani is interested if you could say a little bit more about that, unpack it a bit, the irony of this, you know, that the irony of our shortcomings in conflict as Christians is beautiful and the hypocrisy is more troubling. Say a little bit more about that. Uh, well, I mean, the irony is, you know, when you when you go out to do something and in the process of doing that, you end up doing the exact opposite. I always think that's kind of funny and wonderful. I think hypocrisy is when it's, it's tied up with power and just the fact that um, you are expecting other people to do things that you yourself are not aware that you are doing or that you that you that you need to do yourself. Um, I think that in the Corimila community, you know, we are both very good at talking about how we how scapegoating is awful. And we are also very quick to fall into the trap of us's and them's. And, you know, it's just sort of that beautiful sort of like, aren't we wonderful to have gotten over this issue of us versus them, unlike those people over there. <laughs> and so uh, that um, and I think Christians, anytime Christians claim, as you know, Christians are prone to do, to claim a, a truth that people need to hear, uh, the first audience should be oneself and, and, and to listen to what that, what that um, gospel truth of it is, has to say to our own situation and, and our, own, um, our own claims. 
Okay, I'm going to follow up with you about that in a while, but I want to come to some other um, questions. Becca Lockman has said that it's quite ordinary to enter a church in the United States and to see a flag near the front of the sanctuary. And this has been a point of conflict for Becca when they enter such a place. And is that, Becca's asking, is it the same in Northern Ireland? And if our relationship to this symbol in a place of worship has changed over the years? Do you want to speak a little bit about flags and places of worship? Oh my gosh, I don't want to talk about Northern Ireland flags, but um, I will say that, I mean, clearly <laughs> what you're seeing, therefore, is the, the, the confluence of, of empire and Christianity. I mean, it, it is absolutely um, the synergy of, you know, God and country or nation and divine truth. They're all together in the symbols of what we see in the front of our church is... Um, that's really troubling. And I mean, one of the best things that we did at seminary uh, was that we I had a professor who said, you know, we're always, we're always using scripture to prepare for a sermon, but it would be really good to use scripture to prepare for um, conflicts in your church, in your congregation. So I'm going to give you a scenario and I'm going to put you into two groups. And, and some of you need to go use the scripture to find an argument for, and some of you need to use the argument against. And the issue is, should you have a, a, an American flag in the front of your church? And people were able to use the scripture, uh, scriptures to say, yes, we should, and here's why we should. And, uh, and others said, you know, here, here's the scripture. no, you shouldn't, and here's why you should. And it was a great exercise, in, in, first of all, and say you can use the Bible to almost prove anything you want. Mm. But it also brought up a lot of questions about how um, identity, nation, power, and the the... the conflation of well I mean theology and 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 nationhood and 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 sense of empire it is just absolutely bound up in so much of the West and why Christianity ever since Constantine has to deal with the fact that you know we use we use Christianity um, in a way with the state that is that is troubling and and a little bit hypocrit hypocritical if not you know it's wonderfully yeah. ironic it's also hypocritical that um a religion started by somebody crucified by an empire would be one that's so conflated with empire hmm. yeah uh, timothy flood has a question saying um i'm hearing that answer as being an initiating genuinely horizontal conversation and uh timothy's wondering if you might have anything to say about continuing a conversation what that choice might look like on the field of grief uh, you know, so to, to initiate is one thing, but to stay in a conversation and continue. You do that, Alex, and how do you think about that? Can you repeat the first part of the question? Well, just hearing that the answer when it comes to questions to do with conflict and uh, maybe faith is to consider that there might be a genuinely horizontal question between people who have um, hurt each other or between somebody who represents power and somebody who represents having been marginalized. How, how do you continue that rather than just knowing how to start it off by kind of saying, well, let's let's try to create a horizontal first conversation. What about the 50th? What <sighs> I don't know. I mean, I, I think that in some cases, it's good to remember that, you know, sometimes conflict leads us, the resolution is actually to separate. You know, that, that, you know we don't, not all conflict is best to be um, resolved, that there may be separate situations where it actually leads us to, to separate and you know, sad, but perhaps most healthy. I think the longer term and drawn out has to do with the relationships that we commit to. And, you know, if we can't commit to those relationships, there's your answer. If we do, then it is a long slog and it is a great commitment and mm. does not, and cannot be entered into lightly if you're yeah. there, it's particularly if it's trauma and grief that you're mm. reading into. Yeah. I always think of the word audit within the context of this. Audit is often just used as a kind of a thing that businesses or charities need to do once a year. But the word audit comes from the word to listen. And so for me, a long term conversation where there is a disparity of power is one where I think there is a requirement of listening regularly in it. We've got Gwendolyn Soper here with her hand raised. I wonder, Johnny, if you'd be able to unmute Gwendolyn and um, then we uh, can hear your question. Thanks very much for raising your hand, Gwendolyn. There you are, you're unmuted now. Great, can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Great, glad to be here with you, Padraig and Alex. It really is wonderful. Love the words about fruitful conflict. I'd never thought of that before. And 
holy ground is a grieving ground. I also appreciate um, that you highlighted the word relocate. And my question is, how, how does relocate apply to a person who has relocated away from God because of their inner conflict with the divine and is trying to find a new land from which to connect with faith in God again? From a great ground. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, that's a beautiful question, Gwendolyn. Um, it seems to me, because there's such a falling away during the pandemic, I think religions are hemorrhaging memberships. And, you know, for me, it was this question, of course, is personal, but that it started many years ago. Yeah. Um, I, Padraig will say wonderful things. I will say that um, I, I mean, we're all experiencing kind of the church in free, in free fall at the, at the moment. Um, and part of that, I, I'm, I'm terrified for my friends who are ministers and are tied up with congregations that they love. I am callously um, interested in the fact that, you know, though the mountains should shake and crumble in the sea, you know, the word of the Lord endures forever, that what is true and right and eternal and good will remain. And the institutions that are outdated and, and need to crumble in some ways will. And But yet what is good and true and eternal, what is divine, doesn't need to be protected because it is divine and good and true and eternal. And so I see the transformation happening as painful, particularly because of the people that I love and are struggling with the with the with the vestures of the church. But as far as our relationship with God and and the and the continuation of faith that has to do with love, grace and forgiveness, I am Confident? Maybe not. I am. I, I have an assurance that that will remain um, there for us to be a part of, and and but it does re require the relocation of our relationship with God outside of the structures that we have associated with religion and with faith for, for our lifetimes. And I'm speaking as somebody who's again. I'm, a, my, my, I'm a minister. My wife is a minister. All of our friends at our wedding were ministers. My father, my grandfather, my great grandfather, his six sons, all ordained. This is who I am. And yet, what they cared about was the was the was the fact that when everything else falls away, what remains is true spirit and and, and truly of God. Mm -hmm. I'm um, I'm interested in the moment of the fact that it's not that people aren't um, seeking places of meaning; it's that they're recognizing that the church may not necessarily be the place of meaning, and therefore I think that's an opportunity for people in religious leadership to think, well, what would being a place of meaning be? You know, rather than immediately coming on this committee, that committee, that committee, and being initiated into all kinds of internal small conflicts. And, and demands rather than thinking, what would it be like to be in a place of meaning where we are busy doing something that is of good, uh, but not trying to do everything. And nonetheless, also finding a place where people go on forward to that because I need it. And the question for me is, is what is the need of our broader community these days? Um, Callie Finn, I see that you've raised your hand. I wonder if we could unmute you and then hear your question. Thanks, Callie. You're unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Um, my question is, what does it look like for either or both of you um, to mend relationships when you realize in that awful moment that you've you've missed it, you've made a, a miscalculation or you realize in hindsight you came down on the wrong side? Um, and I, I'm thinking about this in, a, in interpersonal relationships, but also in positions of leadership when we've led a group potentially the wrong way. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kelly. What a question. Alex, you can go first. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I mean, this is so hard. I mean, just, I do this all the time and I just could feel the, the thing drop in my stomach. You know, like, oh God, you know, that was a flippant remark that is just 
rude and cruel and unhelpful in the moment and I have done something wrong or I have just led people in a direction I'm like, oh, that was about my ego rather than, you know, about what was best for the whole or whatever. And I hopefully, I mean, the only thing I can tell you is that what, the, what I think the right answer for me is to realize that that's where the learning that I need to have takes place. And it's leaning into it that that is is the the change that I need to experience and the um, the work that I need to be done that needs to be done for me. And there's two things I'm thinking of. One is that uh, Paul Hutchinson, who's another person that Padraig and I you know get to work with and is is wonderful. And he would he would remind me that you know the um, wherever you're feeling the discomfort, um, if you can turn that into the curiosity. But, and then lean into that curiosity. That has to do with what you know, people that you're discomforted with, and and what is it about them that's driving you ban bananas? Maybe try to figure out the way to turn that into a curiosity about what makes them tick and and why that relationship is difficult. But also, what is it about this discomfort in, in me that I'm nervous about having to own up to some problem? There's a curiosity, and oh, there's some place that I need to learn. I need to, I need to learn. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, just before Padraig, you know, makes more sense, is that um, the, uh, I, I honestly think that this is where faith is helpful for me and why I, I was I was just so privileged to have the, 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 the family that I did. When you do not have to question whether or not you're loved, then you get to get to start diving into your foibles and your mm. sins um, with, with not abandon, but at least with the security of knowing you'll be loved at the end of this too. Wow. That's a fascinating thing you're saying, Alex, about love and then the capacity that love doesn't entitle you, but love actually frees you to, to name some of your own, some of the ways, foibles or, or some of the ways within which you cause damage. I was going to say, like, one of the great joys of being a member of Carmela and having been a leader is that regularly in situations, um, I might have been speaking at a community meeting and I might have said something and somebody would have put their hand up and said, you've just stereotyped a group or you're wrong. That's not accurate. And Carmela is not in does, doesn't in any way pretend to be the perfect community. We're not trying to make little Carmelas around the world. We are a witness to peace in the north of Ireland. That's what we're doing. We're not trying to say everybody should be in a Corimula, be in whatever community you want. But one of the great joys for me of that has been to be in a situation of leadership where it was utterly predictable that somebody would interrupt something I was saying in public by saying, actually, that's wrong or actually that's unfair. And I grew to love and to honor those moments. I tried to reduce them as much as possible um, for myself. <laughs> so, but I, I grew so much being in a community um, within the context uh, of that, because uh, I know so many people who are in community groups and it isn't just church groups. It could be a yoga studio. It could be any kind of charity where the idea of somebody putting their hand up in the middle of a session and saying, actually, you've just stereotyped or scapegoated a group of people, that that would be considered something where the person who raised their hand would therefore, they would have their loyalty questioned. Whereas that is not what happens in Coromila. It's a demonstration of loving each other and loving what we're called to, to to interrupt each other by saying you're being a dick and that has been really helpful for me within the context of that we're nearing towards the end and uh heather i see that you have a question and then after that we're going to we're going to um just wrap up heather sutherland so it's uh, almost a bit of a comment instead of a question i apologize but just with regard to the last question um because i i posted that uh i think that a lot of pastors will find themselves in this position with regard to their response to how the church has responded to queerness. And as a queer person, what I would long to see is a humility and a seeking of building, rebuilding relationships. And I think we're going to find ourselves in that lens with our, the way that we view um, scripture through a white supremacist lens, the way, like there's so many ways that all of us will have to be accountable to apologize to each other. Even the way that like I, as a queer person, respond to people who are a little intolerant of me, hmm. you know, requires an apology, you know, because I haven't met them where they're at and, and always sought out like an understanding for where they're coming from. So um, just on the, the question seemed rooted in a, you know, what do I do as a pastor? What should I do? As, and I think just be honest, be humble. And that's what we all should be seeking. And I really appreciate this conversation, by the way. It's been really life-giving today.
So thanks. Oh, thanks very much, Heather. Um, you've led us uh, very nicely into speaking about what's going to be coming next. I really appreciate that, Heather. Um, next week, I'm going to be speaking with Ruth Harvey. Ruth Harvey is a longtime conflict mediator, and she was instrumental in setting up Place for Hope, which is a mediation body that primarily works in Scotland, does a huge amount of work with um, congregations who are experiencing conflict, whether that's because two congregations have been amalgamated, whether that's because there has been some difficulty with the placing of a new minister in the congregation, or whether it's because the door of the church has been painted blue when it was always yellow and everything in between, questions to do with conflict that occur in congregations. Um, Ruth Harvey has been working in this for many years. And in the last couple of years, she has become the leader of the Iona community, an extraordinary witness to community and to prayer, the revitalizing of worship, environmental sustainability, and questions to do with justice and stewardship in the world. And so we'll be in conversation with Ruth, the same format as today. Ruth um, will bring a text and we'll speak a little bit about the text. She'll, we'll share the prayer that she's written and we'll open for Q&A as well. So the week after that, it's Janet Foggy, historian, theologian, conflict mediator and chief executive officer of Community Energy Scotland. And then our final week will be with Pat Bennett. She is a liturgist and a scientist and a writer and brings the most extraordinary insight into the questions about conflict and theology. Um, and it is Pat who has edited this book that we were advertising earlier on. So I want to finish off by thanking all of you for coming along. We're delighted. The link that you had today will um, work for next week too. You don't need to re-register. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your, for your participation. And Alex, I really want to thank you for being so open to the question of uh, answering conflict through the lens of your reading of scripture, as well as some of my probing questions about the lens of your own life. I hope you didn't mind me asking some of those. Thank you so much for your generosity and open heartedness. And thank you to everybody for coming along. Alex, do you have any final words to say before we finish up? I want to say thank you, Padraig. It's a great gift to us this Advent, and uh, I hope you know it has the sense of being hopeful in terms of being able to use Scripture to deal with things that could be um, frightening, but actually lead us into that kind of fruitful conflict that brings new joy and light. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you a week from today, and I look forward to that very much.